state to try to emulate that in, um, innovation waiver. And so, again, we're seeing some, you know, some new ways of managing government that can provide us with some, you know, some savings. So that's a real bright spot. She actually received a standing ovation in the Labor and Commerce Committee this year. Rich, you had a continuation? The 80th percentile rule is a major one. Um, there's, there's other tweaks that need to be made, but they're complicated. Because of government's uh, insertion into the healthcare industry, we have a very distorted industry for healthcare. Uh, and so to move those things down, it's going to take a little longer than simply one year and one bill. But uh, Representative Grin and I have our eye, eye on some other changes that need to be made, and I will continue working with him on some other ideas. Uh, Representative Sponholz, as well, um, has been a partner with me as we address health care costs, and I'll be continuing to work with her as well. So it sounds like uh, when you, when you Senator Machiki, when you say that, that the Well, let me, um, let me clarify that, please. Um, so here's, here's the problem that we have, is that we have, particularly with the Department of Health and Social Services, wonderful people. Their first priority is um, the availability of medical care for anyone that needs it in the state of Alaska. The legislature has the same priority, but unfortunately, we're the appropriating uh, body that also has to pay the bills, right? So we're being forced to look at utilization, which again is um, insufficiently man managed. So I'm not pointing fingers at any one group, but perhaps we need a more uh, business professional entity that assists the Department of Health and Social Services in the evaluation of those costs so that you can balance adequate health care with how we're gonna pay the bills, right? I think it's time we look at the eligibility standards that we have in the state um, from the expansion group all the way through to the other groups to see if they're set on the right mark. Um, we need to make sure that all of the costs that can be funneled to IHS are going to IHS, which is at 100% federal. Um, so if I talk about uh, an individual user of Medicaid who may for years be using IHS services and they get off track on a visit or a procedure to where they're using state services, often they're lost to IHS any longer and become a 50-50 cost. We need a better system of managing those costs and a much better system of managing utilization. So my discussion on on costs, we, the Senate has obviously been more interested in reducing the cost of this government than the House has. On the administration side, um, the individual departments just have a different view. They, they have a different view because they have a different mission. And our mission, we share on adequate health care. But again, we, someone has to pay the bills and we will continue with downward pressure. And that means that not only the items that were in Senate Bill 74 must be initiated, but we have to continue to look forward. It's the number one cost driver in the state. With, with federal, I think it's $2.7 billion for Department of Health and Social Services. We had a supplemental of $100 million, which with federal was three quarters of a billion. We absolutely have to push back. We wanna stay flat and beat inflation at the very least on the Senate side. We wanna beat that two and a quarter percent escalation from year to year. We were able to do it through the decade and 90s, and by golly, we're able to do it right now. And just to tag on to Medicaid, you know, one of the things we recognized when we did Medicaid reform was the incredible shortage we have of mental health care therapy. Uh, and so the bill that I have that would change the supervisory requirements for mental health care services will change the Medicaid budget going forward. Now, the first thing that Senator Machiki said to me when I told him about that bill, he says, well, wait a minute, that sounds like utilization will go up. Yes, indeed, I hope it will. When clinics have two-year waiting lists to provide mental health services, 
we should be ashamed of that. If we can get children into mental health services and adults into mental health services early on, it decreases the costs going forward as these folks can deal with their issues, get the proper therapy or medications early on, it decreases costs down the road. So it's kind of, I think of it like a river. You know, we're, we're downstream and we see all these people drowning out in the river and we're trying to pull them to shore and get them back on their feet. But it's time to go upstream and find out how they're falling into the river, how we can keep them from falling in uh, and, and treat that early. Other questions? <laughs> no, you were first, right there. Well, we have time for a couple more. Just, just a question, I guess, Senator Giesel, on this. That any thoughts on the gas pipeline? Are you satisfied with the uh, status of, of the AGDC efforts? Uh, Tim, you know, you've seen uh, Senate Finance and Senate Resources Committees uh, questioning vigorously uh, the reports that we get from AGDC. I think you'll see that continuing going forward. Uh, we want to make sure that this is actually a viable project. There is concern about how China will be as an investor in a project. Uh, in fact, as I've worked with Senator Stedman, the Chair of Legislative Budget and Audit, he is actually uh, contracted with a consultant who will be here, I'm not sure exactly what the date is, but in the coming weeks, two to three weeks from now, who will actually brief the legislature on how one works with China as a partner on a project. So these are questions we're going to continue to ask. That's our responsibility as the Board of Directors. Andrew. Uh, Senator Giesel, I haven't gotten a chance to, to look at the bill you mentioned regarding uh, mental health services, but would this uh, increase the role for uh, certain uh, professionals and, and would it um, reduce the um, supervising authority for doctors or what, what would it do? Well, I, I can go into a little bit of depth. We have a rule. It is not a statute, so the legislature did not pass this. It is a rule in the Department of Health that requires that a psychiatrist, that's a physician trained in the area of psychiatry, be physically present in a clinic 30% of the time that that clinic is open. First of all, we have very few psychiatrists in the state of Alaska. And so to get one to sit in the clinic 30% of the time is a pretty high bar to reach. But in addition, it is costly for that clinic. We have a wide variety of mental health clinicians who are qualified, capable, and ready to serve Medicaid beneficiaries, particularly children who don't need drugs. They need folks helping them work through uh, adverse childhood events and, and problem solving. I, I volunteer in a school-based clinic in Anchorage. I provide healthcare services as a nurse practitioner, but we also have mental health services in that school. And the teachers have reported back tremendous results from those mental health services. The children actually are able to step out of class and, and meet with a counselor, and it changes how prepared they are now to go to school and to learn. In addition, those therapists are able to help teachers understand how they might deal with, with kids that have issues most effectively in the classroom. Yeah, just, just to follow up, um, and, and, do you, and do you see that, you mentioned adverse childhood experiences, do you see that having like physical uh, benefits to the children, that is if, they, if their behavioral health needs are taken care of, then they'll be healthier in the future, decades in the future? Uh, Andrew, you must have read reports on adverse childhood events. Yes, um, kids that have had uh, four or more adverse childhood events are much more likely to be obese, smoke, consume alcohol, marijuana, other drugs. It, it affects their whole health. You're right. Thanks for mentioning that. Well, and Andrew, I, I just actually to support that concept, the reality of it is we are regarded as being number one in all of the wrong statistics in the state. People like to separate them. People separate, you know, 
suicide and, and domestic violence and sexual abuse of minors and the other substance abuse problems. They're really all the same problem. And a lot of them, if you can cut it off earlier and stop that cycle, the benefits across the state um, are, would be undeniable. And it affects you in every area of spend, not only that we're our first priority, of course, is the health of Alaskans, but it affects you in corrections and law enforcement and in the courts and Depart Department of Health and Social Services. I mean, it's almost every major category of spend is related to that those issues. So one last one, and we're going to have to, you know. Um, so uh, again, just to wrap up, we are uh, we have been reaching out to the House. Uh, if you got something negative out of that one, Rich, the reality of it is I'm very hopeful and uh, I feel a very um, different sort of atmosphere this year. I think I think the House and the Senate are working rather well together. We're um, <coughs> accelerating the uh, budget process so that we can get it out of the way early. I hope we come to some agreement um, by mid to end March, end of March, um, so that we don't have Alaskans waiting for final decisions long after 90 days. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, anticipating uh, a better result, an earlier result than we've seen in the past. I mean, the, the options are limited. We are insistent about certain issues, like a structured draw. We want to um, keep the cost of this government. We want to keep the growth down. We want to reduce where we can. We are certainly going to beat inflation over the next several years. And I think that's key to closing the gap earlier. So. Look forward to reaching a, a final agreement with them earlier than, <laughs> I'm not going to give you a day, obviously, but earlier than we've seen the last couple of years. I think everyone understands those limited options right now. There's nothing dramatically new that's going to come to the table. So the answers that are available in March and April are not going to change by June. I think everyone realizes that. So I think, I think we're expecting a, a much better, much earlier result. So. Thank you for that, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. What would you do with House Bill 287, Senator Michiki? House Bill 287.